All right, thank you all for being here. Appreciate it. Um, so uh, as Diane said, um, we want to learn from the experts um, and give you a little slice of what it was like to build some of the operators that these folks have built. Um, we've got, as you can see, um, a, a pretty good cross-section of um, different things from uh, ISVs to folks building internal operators. Um, we've got some experts from Red Hat as well. Um, so uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you all for being here. Um, I want to start off with uh, a question for everybody, uh, and this should be an easy one. Uh, I mentioned earlier, it's kind of exciting you can see when you're starting to think through this desired state loop for building an operator, um, that you might have found something out interesting about your software um, or how it interacts with the organization that you're running. Um, so I'm curious just for everybody, uh, what did you learn about building your operator? You, did you find some hard-coded values that you had to undo, weird service discovery logic, something didn't work, anything like that? Let me just go down. Yeah, I guess um, I think the number one, I mean, there's obviously like all these little tidbits uh, that you find when you do this. But one thing that, that I found particularly interesting is that you realize that with all the uh, knowledge that has been built into the operator and the general idea there is that there's a lot of distributed problems out there um, that have already been solved. Um, and once you like you approach and you engage with the with the um, patterns that operator uh, gives you, uh, you realize you know these things have been solved already, and you don't have to solve them. Uh, you solve them again. Um, it was for us. We have a simple leader election uh, mechanism, and it you know it works. But for complex environments, we can get be a little bit more intelligent about it. And operators, you know, clearly showed that that you know we can do better there and can use just existing patterns. One thing I forgot to mention, introduce yourself as well as you go. Oh, I'm, uh, hi. Um, my name is Matthias Lupkin. Uh, I'm the product manager for um, a company called Startup, uh, called <laughs> Instana. Uh, we're a small startup uh, in the APM monitoring space. Um, we actually have a booth out here uh, for the next week, and we do monitoring uh, of Kubernetes and OpenShift environments. Hi, uh, my name is Annette Kluet. I'm with Red Hat. I'm a storage architect in the storage group. And I actually did not create the operator that I um, have been working with. It's uh, the Rook operator. And in, in terms of, I guess, uh, this isn't a surprise, but when you're you know, trying to sort of manage storage via an operator, you have to decide what storage you would like the operator to use. And you know, if you don't do anything, there are ways that it'll consume any available storage. So you know, there's some decisions to make about how much control you give over deciding exactly what you should consume and what you shouldn't consume. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dennis. I work for a company called CapturBase. So because we are, are um, uh, database company, we have lots of configurations. And one thing that we notice is even though YAML files, they are great for a lot of stuff, uh, when you deal with stateful applications, even though your YAML file is valid, uh, it might not be valid according to the current state of your application. So we had to implement a, a very robust uh, admission controller to handle and say, hey, yes, uh, are you sure that you're, you're going to deploy this file because this might uh, make you r uh, remove a bucket or delete your database or remove your backups and all this sort of stuff. And this was one of the things that we have to gather to, to bring basically the whole company and say, hey, what's the, can, can we compile all the knowledge of the company in this operator here to be sure that we are validating according to each possible state. Hi, my name is Balaji. I'm part of the startup called OpsMX. Um, we, uh, we commercialize Spinnaker, which is a CI CD, open source CI CD tool. And we basically wanted to create an operator for Spinnaker. As it, was, it was a nine microservices um, CI CD tool, and it's obviously difficult to maintain the state of all of those uh, microservices and all their pipelines. So one of the things I guess we found is that I think the current tool that's used in the open source community uh, wasn't really doing a good job of cleaning up, you know, or maintaining. Look at the state of the services that it deployed. So when we use the operator, it failed because you guys deleted you know, as part of the framework of, of certifying. 
it, it failed the, the test because some of the services are not even up and you try to delete the, the uh, delete the, uh, the what, what you created. So it was really helpful for us to um, to make sure that we are following through, we are checking the status of all the services, making sure the service is up, and we are we kind of do the hygiene of a good uh, application. We were not doing that before, and so it was now forcing us to think about it and do it, and so it was very useful for us. And I think it is useful for, obviously, the end users at the end of the day, because they are able to deploy and, and get uh, the right behavior. Awesome. Hi everyone, my name is Mark Brucker. I'm a senior software engineer at SIX. Uh, we already heard from our company earlier this, this day uh, how we use OpenShift. And for us, we are a really small team. Uh, the cluster team in, at SIX is uh, based on three people. So uh, we have quite a few customers and uh, a lot of projects. We have an, on the non-prod cluster, we have around 200 projects. And we were looking for something to help us setting up these, these projects that they comply to all our requirements that we have. And we, we found uh, the operator SDK to define a basic set of configuration values um, to to, to set up all these projects. So the operator helps us to set up all the projects the same way, and they all have the same values, the same features, and uh, it also allowed us to, to include the setup of the project into our company's self-service portal, because with the custom resource, we only have one YAML file that we can, can ship from one service to the other, to the, to the cluster, and have everything set up correctly. Awesome. Super cool uh, workflow that you have there. Um, Annette, this uh, question is first for you. Um, storage is extremely critical to the cluster, um, especially as, you know, if we've got a bunch of disks that we're going to aggregate together, we want to um, make those available. Oh, hey. Ah, thank you for joining yes. us. Um, introduce so, yourself. Yeah, just a time for yeah, the yeah. presentation. So, uh, so thank you. I'm I'm Nestor from from Sysdig, and I work for uh, basically Sysdig is a it's a company which which take, takes care about your monitoring and secure or which monitors and secure your cluster. So basically, we do the following: we capture everything that is happening in the host machine using a kernel module module or an VPF probe. And then we can use all of the, that all of that information that we gather, uh, all the CISCAL information we gather for two purposes. What the first one is for monitoring, for happen, for knowing what's happening inside the application, and the second one is about about security. And well, the operators help us. Uh, my personal mission in CISDIG, I work as, as integration integrations engineer, and my personal mission is to make CISDIG available to all the people. CISDIG and also Falco, of course. So operators awesome. help us help us to to that task. Okay. Um, so my next question is actually uh, back to you. So uh, yeah. <laughs> I hope you got your speaking voice on. Um, the interesting thing about Sysdig is you can interact with other non-containerized or non-cloud resources even. Um, so I'm curious uh, if you had to change anything about how you built your operator to interact with that environment where you're not you know, just monitoring kube APIs and things like that. Yes. Yes, the, the goal, uh, basically, we offer, uh, we are opening the, we are, we are opening how Sysdig is, is deployed in, in your cluster. So we can do it using plain Kubernetes manifest. We also have a Helm chart, and we also offer an, <clears throat> uh, an operator. So the good stuff about all of the things we learned the, building the operator is that about around the 70, 80% of our customers are, are on-prem customers. So we need to Polish some details in the in the backend, you know, for for keeping their systems up to date. You have to to upgrade some kinds in the database, so, so taking some backups. The the first one, the, the first approach we did with the client is is almost it's not a big deal. I mean, it's, it's a diamond set with some with some configuration with some fine tuning parameters and and that's, and, and that's all. But the next step is about we are. Considering to use an operator to 
to allow our, custom, our on prem customers to improve its user experience when, when they are managing their cluster. So, awesome. it is, yeah, so. Uh, yeah, it's it's an, a, you know, you got to put some specialized nice opportunity. We, specialized we didn't logic. expect that, that, that use case, but. Cool. Uh, okay. All right, uh, back to our storage question. Um, <laughs> So storage is, is really important to the cluster, and you're aggregating these disks. And obviously, if it's backing your uh, stable storage for a database, or you have backups going uh, to an S3-like interface or something like that, um, you want it to work. Um, so what does the operator do to help protect us from ourselves if we're going to you know, cause havoc on the cluster? Thanks, Rob. Um, so the, the, the Rook operator and the Rook operator that, um, that I've been working with at, at Red Hat is uh, managing stuff storage. So it, it um, is able to do the deployment in a way that really, you know, there's very little interaction. Basically, like I said, you, you identify um, the storage that you want consumed. You identify, you know, what, um, in this case, either Kubernetes or OpenShift hosts have that storage. And then it goes out, finds that, creates the cluster, sets up, um, all of the Ceph, uh, basically, it's, it, it's, it, the, the Ceph tuning is no longer an issue because the operator makes the decisions about how it's going to be tuned. I mean, you can always go back in and change that, but the idea is that it's really sort of hands off. So when you're done, you basically access that storage via a storage class, and you're able to uh, get, you know, in your templates or whatever way you're deploying your apps, you're able to make the claims. Again, you're not you know, knowing exactly what's going on in the back end and stuff. You're just making the claims, and, and persistent storage is being mounted into your workload. So that's certainly the deployment. The, the other part for, for an operator, someone who's operating OpenShift, is um, the whole upgrade and then adding more storage to your, your storage cluster. That, again, is, is all done via the operator. It, all you have to do is essentially go into the to the CRD, the cluster CRD, for example. And if you want to go from one Ceph version to another, you change the Ceph version. As soon as you save that that config, all of the pods are, or the workload um, for Ceph starts restarting, and within probably 10 minutes, you've just upgraded Ceph. You can also go in. Let's say you want to add more storage or add more storage nodes. Same thing. You just add the storage into the cluster CRD, and all of that is um, done by the operator. That sounds like magic. It is magic. <laughs> uh, the, the last thing I'd say about that is, is that the, the Rook operator is aware, very aware of Ceph, but Ceph is not aware of Rook. So it's still Ceph on the data plane. It's all the good stuff that Ceph has, object file and block, but, but Rook is, is watching uh, and, and observing, and, and in some cases, restarting um, services if they go down. That's really cool. Right before the panel, we were talking um, about how you know the availability zones of your nodes really matters, especially when you're talking to a data plane. You want to increase that latency or decrease that latency as much as possible. Um, and that's some of the expertise that the operator just knows how to do, which is great. Um, Dennis, this question is to you, and I know. Uh, you know, the operational expertise that's baked into the Couchbase operator is, is, there's a ton of it. If you look at some of the default tunables that you set, um, there's a, a lot of stuff there. Um, so how did you think through uh, with your engineering team uh, which levels of uh, configuration are exposed at this top level CRD, and how did you think about that? Um, how do you introduce new things over time? Uh, that type of thing. Um, so we started with operators roughly two years ago. Uh, back then, we didn't even know if the operator was the right thing, and since then, it got very popular. Uh, luckily, we made the right choice. Uh, and in our case, uh, we really had to, f f first, in general, even though we want to recommend, hey, this is the production uh, setup, in, ge in general, we send by default we plan how how developers want to to use um, Couchbase. So most of the time they will run on on MiniShift, on MiniCube, or on on um, staging environments. So by default we send a very simple configuration and we have all the defaults. 
And because culture base is very modular, you can pretty much uh, um, adjust the uh, or boost the characteristics you want to according to your application. So if you want to boost writes, your reads, you can uh, add more uh, index and query nodes. If you want to boost your writes, you can add more data indexes. So, because of this, we are very flexible with the configuration, but we spend lots of time uh, trying to understand, hey, how the whole CRD will look like, how can we give maximum flexibility, and also how can we uh, ensure that this is the right, um, this is the single source of truth, even though if someone goes to the uh, web console or the or CLI and try to change something, we will revert the whole thing. Um, of course, building an operator today is much simpler. You can basically create a very simple op op operator in 15 minutes or something. Um, and one thing that I would like to mention is um, do test. E even though your operator will run uh, in our cloud providers, sometimes there are some, uh, some cloud provider specific behaviors. So if you plan to sell your operator or to, to test, please try to get the certification of all cloud providers so you make sure that, yeah, we know that our, we tested our operators, especially when we talk about um, storage. So it's still something that we are working on on Kubernetes. We are trying to make it uh, simpler. And that's basically where we see uh, when that we have is very small different behaviors that uh, we have to handle on the operator side. Awesome, that's really good advice. Um, and you know, I think it, it shows you that when you're thinking through your um, CRDs and that spec, you need to treat it like a public API. You know, it's going to be versioned um, with the group version kind as uh, per standard Kubernetes. Um, but you know, if you get it right, you can have something really powerful, but also you know have a really great default set. So if you're going to spin up a small instance, you know, you just get something that works out of the box, which is very cool. Um, this next question is for Mark. Uh, switching gears from uh, kind of the um, ISVs and, and partners to um, somebody that's building operators internally, um, I'm curious about uh, what types of um, things that you needed to hook into into your own environment um, to build this operator, and how has that kind of shifted the way maybe you set up that environment and some of your future thinking there? Yeah, using the, the operator helps us really much. Uh, we can fast react to, to the needs of our internal customers. For example, some customers wanted to try to, to use Helm charts, and our company policies doesn't allow uh, port forwarding as Helm does it by default to, to connect into Tiller. And uh, we have to, to find a way how to communicate via TLS and an HTTPS route. And since this setup is not that easy, um, we extended the operator to set all this, uh, this configuration for Tiller, for create a service route, creating also the, the client certificates that it's not a non-authenticated uh, communication. Um, and since we are building the operator ourselves, after two days we had the change ready to be tested and the customer can now, by checking a, a Boolean flag, Tiller true, he can immediately set up a tiller in his namespace and uh, use tiller just for himself. Also, uh, we, we use different operator also for, uh, for uh, ingress ACL whitelisting. Um, there we have this, this Tufin firewall documentation tool when we can uh, read all approved connections and f from this um, firewall documentation tool, we generate the custom resource file, apply it to the cluster, and all the routes get the, the correct ingress whitelisting IP ranges that they should have. If the customer overrides it, the controller checks it via the state that it has to be, and uh, overrides everything that's not allowed. Yeah, that's really cool. I mean, think about, uh, you know, this is a, a very sophisticated bank, and you know, there's no tickets, there's not a JIRA workflow for um, getting new whitelists and things like that, getting a new project. Um, that self-service is really, really powerful. Um, so uh, 
last uh, question for you, building on that, is do you have any idea what your next operator might be internally? Uh, I don't know. Uh, everything our customer needs. <laughs> I like it. Everything, basically. Yeah. Love it. No, there are no limits. And, and really, if you have some, some recurring configurations at your company, really think about using an operator. Um, we are currently not allowed to, to open source our solution, but feel free to, to contact me or, or talk to, to Rob and the other guys. They are willing to help and really operators help us as, as much as we would like you to help. Yeah, I'll say uh, come to the operator SIG if you've got some internal use cases that you want to talk to. Uh, some of the experts, we've got a bunch of folks on the phone call um, that can help you with that. All right, uh, next question is to Matthias. Um, so uh, it sounds like Instana has had a bunch of other um, methods of installing your agent on a bunch of different pieces of um, infrastructure. I'm um, wondering if you can contrast using the uh, operator's concept, and I, I don't know if you use our SDK or not, um, versus just other things like Helm or running raw deployments and things like that. Yeah, I, so for Instana, it's, it's important that uh, we get our agent everywhere you know, as easy as, as possible, right? So, you know, existing mechanisms, you know, whether it's a shell script or whether it's a Helm template, if it's YAML or something, you know, we try to, you know, provide it as much as possible. And, you know, obviously something like, you know, the operator, the operator hub is for us, you know, and again, another good step for, you know, being there where our users are, right? Um, but that, that, is just, that is just the beginning. Um, um, and I think you know the day two operations that you know mentioned on on the on the on the path of you know being a more sophisticated operator is something that we're obviously also being going to leverage. Um, our agent itself is pretty intelligent, but um, you know there's always always room for improvement to get better there. And one thing that you know finally clicked with me when uh, thinking about the operator use cases, customer requests, and how we can map that to the operator was, um, and I don't, I'm sorry, <laughs> I don't know who to quote here, but someone said, like, the, the operator gives dom uh, bridges domain knowledge and cluster knowledge together. You have your domain knowledge about your application, and you have cluster knowledge, and you bring these two together. And that's, I think, if you think about that way, then, you know, a lot of, you know, new, exciting ideas pop up. And for us, it's, um, you know, ma making our, um, our agent more intelligent. You know, there's so many complex environments out there, different customer environments, not, not one <laughs> cluster is the same. I guess Red Hat can talk about that a lot. Um, and for us, you know, we want to see that complex environment and make our agent more intelligent, see what's happening there, uh, divide the workload, and operators, you know, brings the cluster intelligence to, to our agent. And we really, in our overall story of automating as much as possible, and you know, making the user uh, making the user experience as seamless as possible that is, fits right in there, and that's why why we're excited about the operator. Awesome, yeah, that's great. Plugging into the ecosystem and kind of those those control points is really really important. Um, next question is for Balaji, and I want to ask about. Um, CI/CD is something, as everybody uh, mentioned earlier, that, you know Jenkins is a tough thing to run, um, and that you know powers a lot of this type of stuff. And uh, you're not going to have just one cluster, but there's going to be many clusters that you're running. Um, so how did your operator um, make clusters uh, feel a little bit more seamless? Like you know you know you're going to roll out to different production clusters in the exact same way uh, using Spinnaker. Yeah. So the, so one good good thing is it is that the Spinnaker itself allows you to deploy to multiple clusters. Um, a single instance of Spinnaker, for example, um, not only on-prem, you know, OpenShift clusters could be AWS cluster, etc. So that itself solves that problem a little bit, I think. But obviously, customers or end users want to have, um, uh, you know, Spinnaker as a service, right? They they want to deploy a Spinnaker per cluster or per customer, their customers. So having the operator is a very useful thing for for us to spin those kind of uh, things very quickly. Um, currently, we're only doing the basic install portion of the uh, of the of the lifecycle, I guess. Um, but this is something. Um, the whole process of lifecycle management is a is a huge problem. We have customers, big customers, large customers, spending months trying to get this right, 
and also scaling is a bigger issue as you start adding more users, et cetera, to the, to the, to the project. So we hope to get, um, you know, we open source this and we hope to open source the other uh, steps as well um, that helps people to adopt uh, Spinnaker or any other in this case. Spinnaker, in our case, um, to be able to deploy uh, across, across uh, for large, large clusters, yeah. Awesome. So it sounds like people are basically using the operator to do a um, kind of as a service internally for their CI environments, which I think, does everybody want that? Does that sound awesome? Anybody have a Jenkins operator by any chance? No, I didn't think one existed. I wish it did. Yeah, so yeah, yeah our goal is to make a Spinnaker operator, essentially, right? So you can, you can spin it up as, as quickly as possible. And, and I think the, the beauty I think we see, I see, is that operator takes care of all the, the things that you would, you would screw up if you try to do it manually in, in various scripts and et cetera. So Anything in particular that you see a lot of people screw up on? Uh, I, I, think, I think, like I said, uh, one other thing what, what we saw was that the, 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 the status of the services, some, sometimes it's not up, sometimes it's down. Ability to look, you know, make sure that things are always in the desired state is a pretty important thing. Scaling is a problem. Um, as as uh, users start adding more users, et cetera, so you want to be able to auto scale. We haven't gotten to the point, but I think that's something that would be very useful to. Awesome. All right, uh, last question, and this is kind of directed at whoever wants to answer, um, is uh, we're always uh, trying to figure out what's the next uh, SDK that we might want to introduce. Um, and so I'm curious if anybody has any opinions and maybe like thoughts around why um, we should choose uh, you know, Python or Java or whatever as our next SDK. Quarkus. <laughs> All right. Uh, you need, a, you need a someone, so if anyone is writing operator in, in Java, and is looking into the Quarkus uh, stuff. Um, that's pretty awesome. Give and everybody a little background. What is Quarkus? Uh, so Quarkus um, is a, based on GraalVM, an environment where um, you know you build Java applications, um, and it uses it uses some some of the you know old you know reduces some or or takes some of the old reflection methods away, um, where you, so you have to do a little bit more during compile time. But the um, result is that you can um, reduce the starting time of a Java applications by a factor of, I don't know, depending on, on your size, on, on factor of 100. So you get like really, really fast um, um, uh, applications built for a you know, cloud native environment. It's not particular to cloud native. Long story short, I mean, Red Hat is pushing, a, pushing it a lot, uh, which, which we like. Um, we are a big Java shop. Uh, not just only for our customers, but also for ourselves. Um, and we built actually our operator with Quarkus itself. Um, so our operator cool. itself is, is built, built in Quarkus. So anyone is like, you know, the next SDK, and now it definitely needs to be Quarkus. And if it, if it is, um, and if, you, if you're building on that, reach out to me. Uh, we love to, to sync on it. Awesome, yeah. Uh, if anybody wants to bootstrap that effort, I think our operator mailing list would be a great place to do that. Um, I'll throw out if you are um, a user of um, Red Hat's AMQ Streams operator, that's actually a Java operator that you know, is, isn't using any particular SDK. It just calls uh, Kubernetes APIs via Java. Anybody else? Any opinions? Yeah, I, I also got contacted from, from our internal customers. They, they saw or read about the operators. And since in our company, most of the applications are written in Java, so uh, a Java SDK would would uh, would would really be used at six. We also have some customers that started uh, learning Go to 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 write their own operator to distribute their application in our company as a as a service. Awesome, yeah. Sounds like Java is very popular. Yeah. Any contrarian opinions on that? All right, we're going to go with Java. <laughs> all right, um, that wraps up our panel. Um, hope you all learned a little bit about operators. Thank you all for joining us. Um, and uh, like I mentioned, uh, go build some operators. Follow these links. Um, and we'd love to help you out with our operator SIG and the mailing list and other community activities. Thank you all. All right. <laughs> <laughs>